We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. I'm going to talk with you today about human domination of the global nitrogen cycle. Now, when you think about the Earth, 78% of our atmosphere is nitrogen, nitrogen gas, N2. So you might wonder, why would nitrogen be a limiting element for life on Earth, which it has been since the very beginning of life? In fact, it and water are the two things which determine how much plant life there is on Earth, and the plant life then determines all of the animal life, including human life. Nitrogen as a gas has this triple bond between the two end molecules, and that bond is incredibly hard to break. When life first appeared on Earth, the only thing that could break it was lightning, and that generated about 10 terabrams, they're called, of available nitrogen uh, every year. Now, available nitrogen is a form of nitrogen other than N2 gas. It's a form like nitrate, nitrite, or ammonia that plants can actually take up and use to grow and to make protein. And that protein clearly is needed by the animals that eat them and so on. And then later in the evolution of life on Earth, there were plants called legumes, which are able to break that nitrogen bond because of some bacteria that live in their roots. And so from hundreds of millions of years ago until the beginning of around the, of the 1900s, that Earth had a very straightforward nitrogen cycle. This major limiting element that determined the abundance of life on Earth was created by two processes that generated about 150 teragrams of nitrogen coming into Earth uh, per year. And at the same time, there were bacteria that earned their living by consuming this available nitrogen and making nitrogen gas in two and they would use up about this amount. So you have an input and an output and a certain amount of nitrogen stored in, on the lands of the earth uh, in its ecosystems. That changed uh, with the discovery of a way to chemically form biologically available nitrogen from N2 in the atmosphere, from nitrogen gas. And we now make about 115 teragrams of that that we use for nitrogen fertilizer. We grow added nitrogen uh, fixing crops, legumes that give us 40 more. High temperature fossil fuel combustion also can break that nitrogen triple bond, giving us 20 more teragrams. And finally, when we clear land uh, to create new cropland, and when we have fires that do this, we release 40 more teragrams of biologically available nitrogen. So now humans truly dominate the nitrogen cycle. The 150, teragrams that comes in from natural processes, the way the world was for almost all of evolutionary history, has added on to it 215 teragrams more, a 140% increase. And we look at what humans are doing now, increasing population, uh, diets that are getting more and more uh, high in meat, we're going to double global nitrogen supplies again in the coming 50 years. Here is what happened to nitrogen at the beginning of what's called the Green Revolution, which helped increase food production around the world, which clearly is a very important thing to do. From then until now, we have increased the amount of nitrogen fertilizer by 860%.
that is a very large increase. As I showed you, this is a, this is a big part of the, of the more than doubling of global nitrogen, this major limiting factor. And doing this allowed us to increase crop production by about 220%. So think about the difference, 860 versus 220. That means that only about one third of the nitrogen that we're applying to crops ends up in what we harvest as food. The rest of it ends up becoming a pollutant. And as a pollutant, nitrogen has some very serious effects. I like to describe nitrogen as being the main currency of nature. We know how money influences the human economy. We know what happens when money is made more available, inflation and so on, uh, goes on. Well, the same thing happens when the main limiting nutrient of most land ecosystems is, be, is made much more available because of, of human domination of the nitrogen cycle. One thing that happens is a health impact for humans. Ammonia from nitrogen fertilizer dissolves in the air and it forms, it's a charged particle, it forms what are called nucleating sites that attract other little fine particles to them. And uh, these make tiny little particles you can't see, which are 2.5 microns or smaller in size. These particles, when we breathe, get deep into our lungs, they enter our bloodstream, they go throughout our body. And the diseases they cause of the heart and the lungs kill about 20,000 people, cause a premature death for about 20,000 people uh, in the United States uh, every year, and many more people clearly uh, around the world. So that's one impact of this domination of the nitrogen cycle, but there are quite a few impacts. Nitrogen that dissolves in the air uh, and gets in the air from agriculture uh, has other impacts. Uh, these maps sort of show by the coloring on them how much biologically available nitrogen comes out when rain carry, uh, rinses the nitrogen that has come into the air from agriculture, from farmer's fields, from manure, and so on, uh, when that is rinsed out and deposited on the land. And the, uh, the brighter colors are high rates of deposition in those ecosystems. And you can see what, it's, uh, what it was like in the early 1990s and what it looks like it'll be around the year 2050. The world has these really large hot spots of very high addition of nitrogen to what are normally nitrogen limited natural ecosystems. Here's what happened in the Netherlands because of this. They are one of the warm spots right now, a high spot for nitrogen deposition from agriculture. They had an ecosystem which was much loved by the Dutch people. They're called heathlands uh, that occurred on sandy nitrogen poor soils. And because of nitrogen deposition, the, these very high diversity ecosystems changed into basically a monoculture of an, of an invasive grass. And then uh, a decade or two after the grass was dominant, this area, these heathlands, which have really had almost no trees for tens of thousands of years, uh, just being sandy soil, low vegetation, grasses and, and heather and so on, is, is becoming invaded by trees and this land is becoming a forest, a huge transition. Well, the Netherlands aren't unique. Nitrogen deposition from the atmosphere has similar effects on ecosystems around the world. This is a, a, a prairie in the, in the uh, Midwest United States, tall grass prairie. And the uh, photo on the left-hand side shows prairie, which is not receiving any added nitrogen. On the right-hand side, it shows what happens when rates of nitrogen deposition, like those that occur in the Netherlands, happen uh, in that, in, to this prairie. A single plant, an exotic grass, an invasive grass, uh, a major agricultural weed called quack grass, invades these systems. It takes them over and it squeezes out almost all of the other species. Very high rates of end addition uh, lead to a loss of almost every native species in these uh, prairie grasslands. Even rates of deposition as low as are happening naturally right now in, let's say, Minnesota, North Dakota, Iowa, and so on. Even those rates cause a 30, have already caused a 30 or 40% loss in plant diversity and the number of plants in these ecosystems. Nitrogen fertilizer from agriculture and nitrogen inputs uh, from other human sources uh, also uh, end up going into, from farmers' fields, let's say, into groundwaters. They go through the groundwater and lakes uh, and rivers and streams into lakes and into rivers and they flow into the ocean. 
And there's been many studies of this. If you look at a major river system, let's say the Mississippi River in North America, you can look at all the nitrogen that has been added to its watershed, mainly because of farming activities, and you look at what's coming out. And watersheds for major rivers that have more nitrogen coming in have a lot more that comes out. This basically, uh, as I mentioned, only about a third of the nitrogen that is put on a, on a farm field in places with intensive agriculture ends up being captured by the crop. The rest of it leaves some of it through the air, but most of it through water. Rainwater carries it into the groundwaters, into rivers and streams, and from there into the ocean. Into the ocean, it causes what are called dead zones. They were named that by fishermen who went out to places they used to fish, and they found all the fish were dead. There were none there to catch. The dead zones are caused because these nutrients lead to a burst of growth in algae in the ocean. And then those algae, uh, after a burst of growth, run out of nutrients, they die. Bacteria eat the algae, and when the bacteria eat the algae, they also use up all of the oxygen in the water. And so you have water now that has no oxygen in it, so fish can't live. The fish die, and you have these big dead zones uh, that form. And not just the Mississippi. Every major river on Earth that drains a large agricultural area now has a dead zone where that river hits the ocean. Here's some pictures showing this. These came from a, a, a colleague and friend of mine, uh, Robert Howarth, a uh, photo of the bottom of the um, Gulf of Mexico in an area away from the inflow of the Mississippi River and an area where the in, Mississippi River is coming in. You can see one very clear water, uh, normal uh, um, marine plants living on the bottom. And the other one, very dense algae, a lot of dead algae being decomposed. No oxygen in this and that water. That's a part of the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Besides being a, uh, a pollutant of freshwater, marine, and, and terrestrial ecosystems, uh, added nitrogen from human domination of the nitrogen cycle is a major greenhouse gas. We all know that carbon dioxide has been increasing in the atmosphere because of fossil fuel combustion. Uh, we may not all realize that nitrous oxide, which is formed by bacteria in the soil uh, from nitrogen fertilizer, is an incredibly potent greenhouse gas. Kilogram for kilogram, nitrous oxide is 300 times better at capturing and holding heat on Earth than is carbon dioxide. And when you look at what's happened from 1980 until now, the increased carbon dioxide is causing, as we know it, uh, warming of the Earth. But in addition to that warming, there's 14% more warming caused by nitrous oxide from fertilizer and from fossil fuel use. That nitrous oxide, that 14% added warming, is actually is quite a bit of warming. Every year, agriculture uh, is about 10% of all the global warming that occurs on Earth, and more agricultural warming occurs not from nitrogen, but from methane, uh, from uh, ruminants, uh, and so on. In fact, agriculture as, as a total, even if we got rid of fossil fuels, we have to change agriculture in major ways to prevent the world to exceed the Paris Accord goals of limiting warming to just two degrees Celsius. So why is so much nitrogen being released? What is it? Why do we do this as humans? Well, we clearly need to produce more food to feed 8 billion people. But the way we're using fertilizers right now turns out, based upon a large number of recent studies around the world, is excessive and highly wasteful of these fertilizers. We can add much less fertilizer and actually get the same or greater production of yields than we do right now around the world. So we're releasing too much because we're basically over fertilizing. Second, we are demanding farmers produce a lot more kilocalories of crops than we actually need to eat. In many countries, richer countries, only about a third of the calories that are produced as crops end up going to the actual human diet. The other two thirds feed chickens, pigs, uh, cattle, etc. In the United States, even more than that uh, uh, goes into feed our cars. We make biofuels out of corn 800 million people around the world are malnourished for lack of calories. And we turn many more calories than they need into biofuels, 
which actually, when you look at the whole, their whole life cycle, are worse for the environment uh, than gasoline. Hard to believe, but they actually are. So we have this excessive demand for crop production. Rich nations demand 8,000 to 10,000 kilocalories per person per day of crop be produced to give them the diet they want to eat. Whereas people in poor countries only have two to 3,000 calories uh, produced to, uh, to get the diets that they have. We are excessively consuming calories and excessively consuming animal meat in ways which harms our health as well as the environment. And basically, farmers don't really know how much fertilizer they should use. They don't know what's actually best for them or best for society. And right now we lack policies uh, that could enforce a wiser use of fertilizer around the world. So in summary, nitrogen is the limiting currency of nature, especially uh, in terrestrial ecosystems. We are adding so much more nitrogen in human domination of the nitrogen cycle. It's a bit like having airplanes fly over uh, a city and drop $100 bills constantly from the sky. Money is a limiting currency for humans. Nitrogen is a limiting currency for nature. If humans could go out in their backyard and get more money by picking up $100 bills every day than they got from a job, they would quit working that job. In nature, the species that are efficient at using nitrogen, a trait that has been important for 3 billion years of life on Earth, um, lose their, their superiority in the system and they are squeezed out, competitively squeezed out by plants uh, that were once rare, uh, that are very inefficient, but grow quickly and can shade them out and, and outcompete them when the major limiting resource of nature has been lost by nitrogen pollution. The solutions we have in front of us are all workable. We know how to do them. We know they work. We know that healthy diets mean less meat consumption. I mean, less uh, and avoids excessive uh, unnecessary uh, consumption of calories and, and the weight gain that comes with it. That helps this problem. Efficient use of fertilizers helps this problem. Having farmers grow another crop called a cover crop when, when the main crop isn't growing helps hold nitrogen into the soil and keep it from leaching into the groundwater. Putting buffer strips on the lower edge of a field helps capture the nutrient and retain it in the system. Instead of growing monocultures, growing more diverse mixtures of crops actually give us more food per acre and do it with less input. And then if we also reduce our fossil fuel combustion, which is clearly necessary for uh, preventing global warming, that also uh, helps reduce the nitrous oxide uh, that goes in the air uh, and also uh, contributes to global warming. So there are well-known ways to greatly decrease human domination of nitrogen uh, and its cycling on Earth. And if we adopt those ways, we will have a much more sustainable Earth to live on. Thank you very much for your uh, for listening to this talk.